This morning, I want to take a moment to, to speak something that is in my heart about the prospect for a good future. We have been studying through the book of Deuteronomy, and even though Deuteronomy's main theme is for God's people to be under God's rule in the place that God has given them, the theme of Deuteronomy also speaks about a shift in the way they will live their lives. I want you to think about this. For 430 years, they lived in Egypt as slaves. Slaves means you own nothing. Everything you do and you have is determined by your master. And so from this slave mentality, poverty mentality, God is bringing them into a season to flourish them. And that means there must be some changes that they need to take place within their life. And why would God do that shift within their life? Why would God bring them into a new season? Why would God bring this new shift in their, the way they live their life? It's for a greater purpose and for a glorious purpose. The purpose of God's redemption and his redemptive work on this planet. So this morning, I want to take time and because... I know that I, I ha always have this as a pastor, I have this burden that I want to make sure that our next generation catch this. Not only follow the Lord wholeheartedly, but follow the Lord wholeheartedly in every arena of life, including their career, including the areas where God is leading them to, uh, to excel in. Because one thing that we find, you know, in, there's a, that is a, there is this myth that happens within Christianity. It's the moment that you have become a Christian. Devotion. You are devoted to Christ. And the devoted life, they usually think devotion as doing some rituals, attending some ceremonies, doing some service, living a certain way of life. Devotion actually means a total involvement of your life. It is not just doing certain ceremonies on Sunday or, or going through church or going through, going through some spiritual disciplines. It is a total involvement of your life where you don't think of yourself, but you think of God. That word devotee that we popularly use in places like India, devotees. The way that you define the word devotee is he's devoid of himself. That means you're not thinking about you, you're thinking about the big picture, you're thinking about God, and you're thinking about how do I honor God with everything that he has given me and in everything he has called me to do. So to be devoted to Christ, we need to think through life holistically, that it's not just about my spiritual life, it is also how I steward my resources that he gives me, all the opportunities he brings my way, how do I maximize it, how do I how do I grow through it? How do I glorify God and build his kingdom through it? So we need to think through that. So my burden as a pastor for the next generation, I'm going to take a break in the way I normally teach in an expository style and give you a one topical sermon from the book of Deuteronomy. And I want to title this, The Prospect for a Good Future. There's a two part for this sermon. Today, I want to cover one aspect of it. Next week, I'll cover the next Go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 10 to 11. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 10 to 11. Look at what the Lord says to the children of Israel through Moses. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your forefathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you with great and good cities that you did not build. I want you to circle that two words, good and great cities. Right there, there's a big shift. These people are people who have been living in the wilderness in tents. They have been nomadic in their lifestyle. Right there, there is a bigger shift that God is going to bring into their life, that they are going to come into city life, dwelling in the cities, good and great cities that you did not build, and houses full of good things that you did not fill. I love it because these are slaves who did not own anything. Their name was not attached to any piece of land. Their name was not attached to anything. They cannot claim, I own this anytime. But now there is a big shift that God is bringing them into houses that they did not build. 
suddenly they're going to become property owners. Now, you and I, we have been, op- we have, our eyes have been open to know that we own nothing. We are stewards of everything. We own nothing. We are stewards of everything. God is the rightful owner. But I want you to think about this, how a shift, a major shift is happening in the lives of these people that God is bringing them to good and great cities that they did not build, houses full of good things that they did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and are full. Third one is vineyards and olive trees. What does vineyards and olive trees represent for them? It it represents that they are now going to be agricultural people. They are now going to start to plow the land and harvest and sow seeds and do things. And they're going to own businesses. They're going to run businesses that are going to produce. And as a result of what they produce, see, these are vineyards and olive trees are their means of income. This is how they will produce their income. So what God was designing now is there is a shift in the way I'm going to bless you. There's a shift in the way I'm going to use you. And now in this season of your life, there will be vineyards and olive trees. And those will be for your own consumption. Plus, you will produce more than what you need so that you profit from it. You produce, you have profit. That will be your way of income. So now he's teaching them a new way of what what to expect in life. Then go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy 8, verses 7 to 10, and verse 18. Look at what the Bible says. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. Again, he highlights, I'm bringing you into a good land. A land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs, flowing out in the valleys and hills. A land of wheat and barley, of wines and fig trees and pomegranates. A land of olive trees and honey. A land in which you will eat bread without scarcity in which you will lack nothing. Circle that. A land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. God is giving them a revelation of the land that the land is able to produce not only figs and pomegranates and olives and wheat and barley, but also the land is filled with stones from where you dig and you get copper and other things. And the verse 10, and you shall eat and be full and you shall bless the Lord your God For the good land he has given you, as a result of you being filled and being satisfied and having nothing to worry about and nothing to really be anxious about, God says, make sure you bless the Lord your God for the land he has given you. Then verse 18, if you do this long enough, the more surplus you keep producing, you will accumulate wealth. God knows that because he has given them the good land. You know, simple strategies followed over time, consistently. Even, even if you, are, you didn't start with that much capital in your life. Simple strategies that you follow regularly and consistently and stay a disciplined way of life. It will help you accumulate a lot in life, isn't it? Come on. I'm speaking to Asians. <laughs> uh-huh. I'm speaking to people who are entrepreneurial in their orientation. I want you to listen to me carefully. God knows that you'll you'll be able to take what he has given you and accumulate wealth over time. So what God says in verse 18, you shall remember the Lord your God for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. I love that. He says, I know you will have wealth. And the moment you know that you have wealth, don't think you got it by yourself. Remember, it was the Lord your God who gave you the power to get wealth. And why would he give you the power to get wealth? He gave you the power to get wealth so that you can, so that he can confirm the covenant that he made with your fathers. Now ask yourself the question, what's the covenant he made? That will be part two of my sermon next week. But today I want to just focus on the first part, that he's bringing you into a good land. And in that good land, he gives you the grace to prosper. Now if you go with me back to the chapter six, you will find, you will notice that God gives them three things. Let me give you these three things. God gives them three things 
when they come into this good land. Number one, they will come into good and great cities. What are cities represent? You and I, we migrate from city to city. Come on. Even if you were born and brought up in a village, you want to come and live in a city. Why do people do that? Why do cities are the most populous places in the world? Why? Because it has the infrastructure for us to grow and develop and, and maximize life. So good and great cities represents everything that goes with it, the opportunities. I was recently talking to somebody who moved from Perth to here, and they were, talk they were saying, yes, in Perth, there is not many opportunities for young people as they come to that age where they need to find work. So they got to move. And I know some of you in this city, you have moved from, even within Australia, other regional centers, you come to the city. Why? Because there is opportunities. God says, I will give you opportunities. Our God is a God who gives you opportunities, and he expects you to take advantage of the opportunities. I want you to listen to me carefully. The second thing he gives them is, he gives them houses full of things, full of good things. In other words, he is now giving them the experience to own stuff. The experience of having their name put on a title deed. To have to own a piece of land. Ima imagine this, for 430 years they were slaves. They were working their, 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 their life away and own nothing. But when they come into this promised land, God says, I'm going to give each individual in every tribe will get ownership of a land. Wow. And it will now be perpetuated. It will now be carried on from one generation to the next. From one generation to the next that it will continue in your line. That means now, finally, you, you, got, you got something that you can claim and say, this is something that God has earmarked for me. This is mine for me to steward. Praise God. The third thing he gives them is vineyards and olive trees. The vineyards and olive trees, what he gives them is the power to produce. See, vineyards and olive trees don't go by themselves. Someone have to... So plant and someone have to harvest, someone have to do the work. And that's why when the Bible says, I'm giving you a land flowing with milk and honey, you and I, we need to understand milk need to be milked and honey needs to be collected. So someone need to milk the cows and get stung by the bees. No work, no wealth. What he's saying is bringing this back to this, back to the theology of God blesses the work of your hands. That God multiplies the work of your hands. That God is a God who, who wants you to produce in life. Listen to me carefully. Many people in life move with, with a consumer mentality. But God never called you, you and I, to live uh, with a consumer mentality. God called you to live with a producer mentality. That means he calls, causes you to produce. He wants you to produce, produce in effect what he wants to produce in this world with the opportunities he has given you. This is something that God gives you grace for. So I want you young people to listen because, they, you know, um, they say this generation that's growing up is very what? Entitled, very privileged and very entitled and kind of a demanding generation. What have you done for me? What have you, I meaning in that sense. But I know we are raising godly generation. But I want you to listen to me carefully that it is, it's, it, it is upon each generation that you need to know what is God entrusting to me to produce. So here, I believe that there are cities that means take advantage of the opportunities. Property, take stewardship of the resources. And businesses, take what God has given you and produce. And as a result, there will be profits. And over the years, there will be wealth. He brings it. But how many of you know this is going to be a game shifter for the Israelites? It's going to be a total game changer. Because Israelites are not used to this. Here is where I plug in two things. I want you to write down in your notes. Number one, there is a different season that God is bringing them. Think about this with me. The season that God is bringing them. What is the season? 40 years in the wilderness, this generation experienced a different season. What was the season? That season was a season of miracles. It's a season of miracles. But the moment they cross the river Jordan and come into the promised land, it is no longer miracles. It is a season of blessing. Two different words, not just in spelling and pronunciation, but in the depth of understanding. Miracle means I'm at a place where I can't produce on my own and I need God to move on my behalf supernaturally. Wilderness is a place where you can't plow and harvest and do because you're not staying in one place long enough. 
And there is no proper system for those things. So what God does, miraculously sends them manna, feeds them for 40 years, sends them meat when they desired it. But now when they come into the promised land, the shift takes place. God now says, manna is not going to come. Meat is not going to come where I'm going to swing the, the birds to come to you. But now you're going to plow the land, cultivate it, grow, develop, produce. You produce, you eat. In other words, there's a big shift in the, in the, in the, in the promised land. There's a sowing involved. There's a reaping involved. There's a, there's, a, there's a different principle, different paradigm that they need to enter into. The second thing, I see is, Israelites, when you compare them with all their brothers, there's a big difference. I want to take a, take a step back and give you an overview of the, the, the family background. You know, even within families, kids are wired differently, isn't it? With different folks, different strokes, we say, right? Because they are wired differently. You can't expect the same, way, same return on investment on each kid. <laughs> Kidding. Kids are different. They are very differently wired. But the reality is this. You, even in the biblical family, you find that in, 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 in the godly lineage. See, I want you to go back and read Genesis 5 when you have time. Genesis 5 his, records the history, the background of Seth. Adam and Eve had Abel, Cain, and then Seth. Seth is the godly lineage. And the godly lineage, you look at their historical record, what is recorded of them is they pray, they worship, they walk with God, they build altars, they bow down, they worship God, they build altars. That's what is recorded. You go to Genesis 4. Genesis 4, we're going to read a few verses from there. The, the guy who we call naughty, rebellious, sinful, God earmarked him as a rebel, Cain. His lineage is recorded in Genesis 4. You know what they were doing? When the, when the children of God were doing building altars and worshiping, you know what they were doing? In Genesis 4, verse 17 to 22. Listen to this. Genesis 4, chapter 4, verse 17. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch when he built a city. Underline that word. Where did this guy get the wisdom to build a city? He's sinful. Come on. He's rebellious in his core being, but the Bible says he built a city. You got to understand he built a civilization. City, the word is so rich, it means he built infrastructure. You got to, for something to be called a city, there must be a political organization. There must be an economical provision. There must be an educational system where people can pursue knowledge of art and spirituality and other things. And there must be arts and entertainment. There's a whole social infrastructure. The Bible says he built a city, and then he gave birth to a son, and then the son gave birth to another son. Go with me to verse 20. And one of his great-grandsons, Ada, bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. This was the first time farming and agriculture comes into the world. I want you to listen to me. These are people who we consider, man, they don't, but the wisdom of God still is operating. And they are now building, what, is, what are they building? They're building farming and uh, agricultural and, and raising livestock. Then verse 21, his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. In other words, these are the guys who invented musical instruments. And these are the guys who, who, who are taking all the charts in music and entertainment in those days. Number one hits came from this family. Who played the lyre and the pipe. And then verse 22. Zillah also bore Tubal Cain. He was a forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. Wow. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. In other words, this is the first time the Bible records that they were now industrious. They were producing weaponry. They were producing, uh, they were producing and mining and manufacturing. Look at this. The picture that God gives here is, this is the beginning. These are the origins of industry. This is the origin of invention, discovery, bringing new things into the world, products being produced. Even today, you know, even today, even today, we actually rely on the technology. I'm using all the gadgets that I invented by people who do not follow the God you and I follow. What is the greatest production that Christians do these days? I come from a land 
that has one billion people, right? One billion people. And we have at least six to seven percent Christians in that one billion people. You know what is the greatest contribution we would have made in the last, just in the last 40, 50 years? It is worship songs. We produce CDs. We write songs for everybody to sing and worship. I want you to listen to me carefully, young people, because you're also living in a day and age where the popular culture of what Christians produce is only music. Don't reduce what God has called you to produce with the mind he has given you, the wisdom and the, and the access you have in the heavenly realm. Don't reduce it down to four stanzas and a chorus. Don't reduce it down to some lyrics that you can write. Don't reduce it down. I'm speaking to my own children in this room. You can get inspired, but that's not the contribution of the Christian world to the community. The Christian world was once upon a time the leaders in, in many things. In the last century, we have reduced it down to just writing songs and growing around and having concerts and light sounds and action. That's what it is about. Come on. Let me not go on on that tangent. What I mean is, there is more to kingdom work than just doing concerts and music and inspiring people. I want you to listen to me careful. God is asking you to be a producer. Not a producer, not a pastor, I'm a producer. I'm a record label producer. <laughs> no, that's not what he's asking you. God is calling you for something more. My prayer is that God will raise entrepreneurs. It has always been my dream in, with the church, with the church, that churches ought to be the peop places where they raise the leaders, they raise the entrepreneurs, they raise the disciple makers who go into the marketplace and lead, lead. So listen to my heart. Raising the next generation of entrepreneurs. That's what I tell all our youth leaders. You're not just here to disciple the kids. You're not here to just disciple them. Give them the entrepreneurial mindset. Develop that. Work on that. Make them read books that, they, that will expand and grow them. Why? Because we need a next generation that rises up with entrepreneurial spirit that will be business leaders. and be. But the only thing that will separate them from the rest of the world is they will be countercultural in their values. That is why discipleship is important. That you develop them to be countercultural, not just adapt to the lifestyle of the world, not fall in love with wealth creation, wealth accumulation, and financial freedom, and live a, uh, live a very jolly good life. Come on, don't reduce it down to that. But be a person who, who has big dreams that God will give you grace to go and do what God has called you to do to this nation, to this world. Because God has called us to disciple the nations. And part of discipling the nations is solving the world's problems. Listen to me carefully. You and I, we are producers. We are called to be people who bring solutions to the world. Because we operate on a different realm of understanding and insight and wisdom. And if you and I don't have that, who else will? You know, you and in my free time, I usually go and read about stuff. United Nations came up with eight Millennium Development Goals. And this is what the, some of the Millennium Goals are. Let me read it for you. Eradicate extreme poverty and hunger. Achieve universal primary education. Promote gender equality and empower women. Reduce child mortality because there are children who are dying because there's no access to vaccines or medicine or clean water or good food. <clears throat> Improve maternal health. Combat HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases. And seven, ensure environmental sustainability. And number eight, a global partnership for development. You know, when I read this, I come from Asia. I come from India. I've been to many parts of Malaysia and many parts in the, in the Asian region where missionaries came once upon a time to spread the gospel. You know, the, do you know the, 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 the method that the missionaries followed? The pattern in which they did things. They actually address all of these concerns. When you think about, when I think about India, when they came and the missionaries came, the first thing they will do is they will start a feeding program for the poor. 
They will take the orphan children or the malnourished children and, and the people who can't afford to even give proper clothing or food to their children and they will start an orphanage or they will start a house and they will bring the kids in, feed them. That's how they spread the gospel. That's the first thing they did. Then they realized these kids need to be educated. They started schools. Many of you proudly say, I went to Christian school. I went to a Christian school. You know, those Christian schools were started not to be a money-making business. In this country, you go to a Christian school, you got to pay high fees. It was started with a mindset to give free education. Why? Because the greatest education you give to lift a family is not science and math, it's theology. So they bring them in. They bring them in, feed, them the, feed the children, give them theology, and then give them math and science and help them become great in their potential. I'm a fourth generation believer in Christ in India. My family have seen what the missionaries did. We grew up under that era. I'm saying to you what they did, what they used to do. They started schools. They started universities. They gave women education and skills. The women were treated equal long before government comes and says, let there be gender equality. The church was the one who pioneered that in those days. We waved the flag to lift the game for the women. Why? We educated them, gave them skills, we brought them in, and we, we gave them a hope that there is a, there's a place. That's why even today you go to these Asian countries, guess who comes to church more than men? Women. In large numbers. That's one place where they feel so safe to come. That's one place where they know they can come and they will, they will not only grow and be developed in their spiritual life, but also in a developmental life, in every aspect of their life. Society was touched. This is why we, we, the missionaries built hospitals and built clinics. There were a lot of doctors who gave up their, their career that could, they could have had a luxurious life in their, in, their, in their hometowns in UK or US or Europe, anywhere. They left all those things. They came to Asia. Why? They, le they left their, their, their... They come before God and they say, God, I have a gift. What do I do? Go, spread the gospel. They did. <laughs> and then as a result, they built churches for people who got saved and then built Bible colleges. Today we have the other way around. We go build a flashy church everywhere we go. And then we see what we can do. Why times have changed, Pastor? I tell you why times have changed. Baby boomers happened. That's why it changed. It is actually recorded, well-researched and well-documented. Boomers are the first generation that came out of that, that mindset where they had depression and uh, the parents suffered through wars and all that. And the first generation that was going in through that industrial revolution and first generation that could actually live a decent life and come to a place where they can accumulate wealth, it was the baby boomers. And that is the generation that truly pulled everything back, and the generation that followed after them, which is the Gen X, the Gen X. So what's baby boomers? Baby boomers are anyone who was born in 1940s onwards. So if you're born in that age group, you're the evergreen right now. That age group. That age group was concerned about building wealth, building a good lifestyle, and giving the children a great future. They did. They worked hard for that. But you know what? Along the way, they, they forgot they forgot why God would give them this grace. Along the way, they forgot why God will give them. You know, in India, we will have this dream when you're growing up. It's, it's all about buying a plot of land. I'm not saying it's my dream. It's what they, they had dreamed. You know, they buy a plot of land, build double-story house, and then paint it yellow, white, green, whatever color you like, and then say, all right. Because that's the dream we have. Whether it's an American dream or an Australian dream, it's a dream. It's the same dream. I want to own a piece of land. I want to build something and live a comfortable life and have something for the future so I can retire well. Because in my retirement, I still like to travel. And I would like to travel everywhere. So I do want to have a comfortable life. This is how self-centered we have become. Nothing wrong with this mindset. But something's terribly wrong if we negate or we don't think about why God actually gave us this grace. 
Missions agencies are saying it is the next generation that don't want to come into full-time ministry. You know, there's missionaries, missions agencies are struggling to find new missionaries. Why? Because baby boomer generation to, taught their kids, look after yourself first. You can serve God later. But right now, make money, buy houses, build whatever you can, build a career, build a future, secure your future, buy an inheritance, buy everything, everything you save up, then you can do whatever you want to do. By the time they do all that, they're already 50. By the time they're 60, lose all their teeth and what can you do? Listen to me. Please don't get me wrong. I'm speaking with a great burden in my heart. In a disciple-making church, we want to raise a generation that says no to this cultural thinking and be counter-cultural. We have a God who is able to provide. We have a God who is able to multiply. We have a God who is able to give you the resources that are hidden in secret places, he says. Why are we lowering everything down to this? I'll tell you what the Bible says. Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, my people are destroyed for what? For lack of knowledge. In another translation, the root word is actually, my people perish for lack of knowledge, which is ignorance. Write that word down. Ignorance. You know what ignorance means? It's two words. Ignore. Stands. You don't take a stand. You ignore to take a stand. That is ignorance. That means you neglect to take a stand. You refuse to take a stand. You don't want to be countercultural. You are cultural in your thinking. That is ignorance. Ignorance is nothing more than you refuse to see what God wants you to see. And you refuse to live like what God calls you to live. But you want to do your own thing. That is ignorance. Because you ignored the fundamentals. You ignored the big picture. And you never took a stand. So in the life of children of Israel, let me come back to this. Let the child of children of Israel, God has to do a major work in shifting their mindset. So what does God do? God sends some beautiful training grounds. Wilderness was a training ground, people. Do you know when I think about the necessary journeys that people did in the, in the gospel, in, in, the, in, the, in the Old Testament? These are the necessary journeys. Let me talk about Moses. Moses, the guy who's leading them into the promised land. Or bringing them into the brink of the promised land. You know what Moses, Moses was trained. God had to separate him from his father's house. Think about this. Why would God separate a child from the father's house? You know why God separated them? Because if he had grew up in his own father's house, he will only be with a slave mentality. He will only have, what can I earn today? What can I, how can I find my food today? That is the level of his thinking. Because that's the level of his exposure. But God had great plans for him. So what God does, pluck him out. Three-month-old baby, God plucked him out. And put him right under the nose of Pharaoh. Pharaoh has just commanded every baby to be killed. Every Hebrew child under the age of two will be killed. Everybody is being dead. And then he, he gets a report. All dead? All dead. Everyone dead. Okay, everyone dead. Then comes home and says, chi 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 Good, love Moses. Very good. Hmm. That's what the Bible says. In other words, God put him right under Pharaoh's nose and said, take care of my deliverer. Why? God needed to train him. The Bible says, look at this, in, in Acts chapter 7 and verse 22. Acts 7 verse 22, the Bible says, Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and deeds. Why would God put him in, in, in Pharaoh's court? It was a training ground, people. It was an exposure. It was an education. It was a training. It was a development. What was it? It was a development in his thinking ability, in his capacity to do things. God changed everything. God is a God who gives you grace to be trained. Let's look at Joseph. Joseph, we all know he was the favored son in the father's house. And then God plucked him out. You know, when you go home and read Genesis 37, you find this fascinating story, how the brothers got jealous of Joseph. And the best thing they can come up with is dig a hole, bury him. 
And then one guy, clever, comes up. Why do we need to bury him? Look, those guys are coming. They are traders. They are going to Egypt. Take him, sell him to them. First time they sell. Human trafficking. Not by the evil men. Started in the family of God. I want you to listen to me carefully, people. That's how these guys were in their thinking. So they sold Joseph to who? One day when I read that, my, my goosebumps just went up everywhere. I'm like, Lord, have mercy on us. You know who were the ones that were traitors? The Bible says they were the Ishmaelites. Isaac, I'm the promised son. My grandsons are selling each other. Ishmael, his grandsons are already doing trades. <laughs> They're going from one country to another to do profit and trade and transaction and, and, and do all this. In other words, they were dominating the business world while our guys were plotting how to be number one. Why do we have in this country so much church splits and political politics inside the church? Why would that happen? The cry of many pastors that come to me and cry to me is it's just so much carnality in the hearts of people. Why? Power struggle. Who will be number one? Who has the control? Because we are, we are, we, we were just, we, we are, because we, we are not captured by a heavenly calling to do something bigger and glorious, but rather we are so small in our mind that we just want to be the big fish in a small pond. Listen to me carefully. God has called you for something. He gives you the grace and the resources. So all they did was they just sold him. <laughs> And God said, okay, I'll use what you guys do and bring him right to Egypt. Where did he go in the Egypt? God chose the place for him to be trained was in the prison. Why would God put him in prison? Because he stayed in the prison as a teenager. He entered the prison as a teenager and he lived there for almost 13 years in prison. Why would a young man be so tortured and put in a prison 13 years? Because God had a great destiny for his life. At the age of 30, he's going to be the prime minister of the land. You don't take a dumb guy and make him a PM. You don't take a guy who's not exposed and educated and trained and qualified and become the prime minister of the land. You don't do that. So what does God do? God puts him in prison. <laughs> Prison is a great place to be in those days for them in Egypt. Why? Because that prison was a particular prison where the political prisoners were held. Who are the political prisoners? These are the guys who directly offended Pharaoh and the top officials. Remember Pharaoh's butler, Pharaoh's baker? These guys end up in that prison. That means the who's who in Egyptian politics are in that prison. Wow. That means Joseph gets first-hand university education in what? Political science. You and I, we look for, where can I go for MBA? That's the best MBA you can have. Because you're trained by the highest thinking echelon of leaders in Egypt because they're all thrown there somehow. And you, I know people, I know people. When you sit down, you're not going to talk about, how, oh, how's the weather today, huh? The food is so bad. No, they're going to be talking about politics. They're going to be talking about the temperaments of Pharaoh. They're going to be talking about constitutional, the way the, way the, the Egyptian government works. They are giving <laughs> Joseph the first time experience of what it means to run Egypt. Come on. Finally, the time comes. He stands as a 30-year-old. Standing before Pharaoh, the Bible says God gave him incredible grace. Look at this, Acts chapter 7 and verse 9 and 10. The patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, Acts chapter 7 verse 9, jealous of Joseph, sold him to Egypt. But God, hallelujah, but God was with him and rescued him out of all his afflictions, gave him favor and wisdom. You and I, we need to understand that wisdom is principle. Wisdom means, there are three types of wisdom. Let me give it to you. Three types of wisdom. One is the wisdom that comes from being trained. I go to a doctor when I need something for my health. Why? Not because he prays hard. <laughs> you don't go to a doctor because he's, he's praying very hard. No, no, you go to a doctor because he's got a degree that's displayed there. 
and that says he's wiser than you when it comes to matters of health. So you go to him. Why? He's trained in the system of health. So you go to him. That means that's the wisdom. The first thing is the, is the trained, training, academic skill set that God gives. That's number one. That's why don't despise the education. If your parents can pay for it, take all the money. Get as much education as you can. Are you with me so far? <laughs> we need. We need people who can think. We need people who can solve the problems of this world at a larger scale. Not just think about my two-story house and my plot of land and, and my retirement fund. No, no, no. Much bigger. The second type of wisdom is the wisdom that actually comes with sheer intelligence. Just, it's not your training ground. It's not your place of expertise. But you have built enough exposure that you know how to translate your wisdom from one to another. That it comes as a result of exposure. I meet CEOs of companies. I meet business owners in my travels. I sit down. Sometimes they just open their life and share with me what they're going through. Suddenly, there is a word that comes, and I give them that word. And that word may not be from the Lord. That word just came from my spirit because I knew uh, that God has given the grace to take what I have experienced in one realm of my life and to see what, how this two and two connect together and intuitively share something. And that becomes a breakthrough. My wife can tell you, testify, how many, so many of them who will come and testify that God gave them a breakthrough because of just one thing that came out of my lips. I have no idea how to do your business. That's one thing. But the other thing is, there's another kind of wisdom. That's the wisdom of heaven that God genuinely imparts to you. The word of wisdom, the, the, the wisdom beyond your years of understanding. And you speak with such conviction and wisdom. So when the Bible says he was, God gave him favor and God gave him wisdom, the Bible says it all three. I believe he, he had all three. Because Pharaoh is not going to be a joker who will just say, oh, you gave me an interpretation for my dream. Here, take my ring, take my country, take everything. You rule. Because it will all come down. But what God does is so beautiful. God trains and equips. That's why don't resent the fact that you have to go to uni or school or being educated. Be, read all the extra books you can. Get all the help you can. Come on. Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. To bring about that many should, people should be kept alive as they are today. Joseph did not go through all that training ground. God did not train him all that so that he will have a comfortable life and a great retirement. No! Joseph went through all that so that people will live, will be kept alive. Joseph was the first guy to solve world hunger problem in his generation. <laughs> he solved the world hunger at that time. In other words, God prepares you for that. God gives you grace for that. Can I humbly say this? Don't ever, young people, listen. Don't ever work for money. Money is not the goal. Money is not the goal. That's why we always say in this house, you come to the Bible college, I'll teach you on this, that you're not thinking about what is my package. No, no, no. You go before God and you ask, God, where do you want me to take? What do you want me to do? Where are you placing me? You've given me a gift to study. You've given me a brain to understand. You've given me a dream to live for your glory. Take me. What do I need to do with it? God will take you. God knows how to prepare you. And God will give you the right time, the opportunities to, for you to flourish. But you've got to come to that place where your heart attitude should be, no, I'm not driven by money. I tell pastors this. Don't work in the, in the ministry for money. Money is not the case. You know where they put money in, in, the, in, 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 in the New Testament? The Bible says they brought, people sold their houses, brought the money. Where did they place it? Not in the hands of the apostles. Not in the pockets of the apostles. You know where they put on the feet of the apostles. In other words, you are a man of God. Have the money under your feet. Don't let it climb up. If money gets to your head, you're screwed. In other words, that's where the whole thing changes. Your whole philosophy of life changes. I'm entitled for this because I've worked hard. Oh, this is my privilege being this. No, 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 no. Money should be down there because money is a tool. 
that God gives into your hands for millions to go and be blessed. The one reason why, my, 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 I told the church when I came into this country, they said, we can't employ you. I said, I don't need anything. I worked. I paid my dues as a volunteer. Even today, I tell every leader, I said to you, I'm not here because of the money. Because I actually, I'm, I've come to this country knowing and acknowledging that it was God who brought me here and he is able to give me a good life. And he is able. So our motivation of our heart is never about the package, the pay packet, and what is the privilege, where do I get the benefits, what is the scalability here. And that's not how we ask. People of God are wired differently. They think, God, where are you sending me? I'm a missionary. I'm an apostle. God, you give me grace to steward what you're giving me. We ask different questions. Don't be motivated by money. We always, I teach you this, money is a currency. It's a current. It flows. You are walking in the right path. It will flow to you. You are doing the right thing. It will flow to you. You're following the heavenly vision. Provision will come. You don't need to go after it. But pastor, it's so easy for you to say all this. Huh? Let's talk some practical. <laughs> Yesterday I was just sharing a testimony. I'll just plug that in here. I can't see what time is it. My wife and I, we, we bought the house on in the year 2002 when David was, when she knew she was pregnant. We went to the guy, we went and bought the house that the Lord said, buy this. We bought it. We saved up for a couple of years of our married life and we had enough to go and bottle and buy it. And when we bought it, and she, she was heavily pregnant, she was probably about a few months before giving birth in July. She goes, I want to go on a holiday. I said, you know, we emptied everything we put the, in the house. You asked for a holiday. She said, I'm not asking you. I'm just letting you know we will be going on a holiday. I said, why? He said, I'm asking the Lord to provide. <laughs> How wonderful it is to have a wife who doesn't look to the husband for provision. <laughs> I'm so blessed. You got to understand, this girl went out with me when I had nothing in my pocket. Zero. You know how I proposed to her? I said, hey, marry me. <laughs> no ring, nothing, right? <laughs> but when I came here, when I came here, first time when I came here, now it's a story within a story. When I came here first time, I had absolutely nothing in my pocket, but I, we have just been, our father just gave permission, so I'm going to pro propose to her properly and give her a ring, but I don't have money to buy a ring. So all I know is in the morning, I just prayed, Lord, just provide something, because I, in this culture, they say you got to put a ring. <laughs> See, I'm not part of this culture, that's why I don't, still don't wear a ring. <laughs> so on that day, on that day, after I prayed, just on that day, a couple whom I hardly know, just came to say, the Lord just sent us, no, we, we are so excited for you and Isa. And then they opened, they gave an envelope in my hands. And I said, no, 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 what is this for? What? No, this is for you to buy a ring. Buy a ring. I said, wow, buy a ring. I just prayed this morning, buy a ring. Open it up, 1,000 Aussie dollars in the year 2002 to buy a ring. So I said to my wife, God just provided, I'm going to buy your ring, what do you like? She said, how much did they give? Thousand. Wow, God provided thousand. Tithe go out. The rest, so I brought her to the shop. She bought, for $300, she bought both the engagement ring and the wedding rings for the two of us. <laughs> Have you ever heard of someone so cheap? <laughs> God provide thousand. Within that, she budget queen. She budgeted everything. She goes, no, 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 no. What? No problem. Within 300 bucks, we finished <laughs> engagement ring, wedding ring for the two of us. Wow. God provide. So we, we, we <coughs> no, you asked me, where was the story? The beginning story was, yeah, bought the house. Now, <laughs> she said holiday. And I said, no, 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 trust God. God he, she said, God will provide. And she goes before God. And the Lord gave her grace. She does, in those days, we only drink Cortis Cordio. Cheaper, la, that one, yeah. So we buy the Cortis Cardio, and she bought that. She brought it to the house. She found that in the label it said, enter this code on the website. So she goes and enters the code on the website, leaves it. A few weeks later, 
right, after we had all this conversation and all that, a few weeks later comes in the mail an envelope that says, you just won a holiday <laughs> to Tasmania for four adults. We give you air tickets for four adults. We give you car hire money and we give you car hire. And then in this chain of hotels, you can have 10 days stay from, Launce from Hobart to Launceston. Take your pick, this chain of hotels. And then uh, amount for daily expenses. I said, okay, two of us is taken care of. Who are the other two? So I went to my in-laws, my father-in-law, mother-in-law. I said, we would like you to come. You just pay for the food. You just come with us for the holiday. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but all I'm saying is, we had one of the best times together. We went out and had a fun. The Lord honored a simple girl's request. That's why you ask me. I'm not motivated by money. No need to. Why? He's opened up heavens. I have a father in heaven who lavishes. He's not just a God who gives you what you need. He's a God who gives you the desires of your heart. I'm not saying that I'm, I'm so materialistic. I'm always going to be motivated like this. No. I'm saying I, I want to follow him. I want to please him. I want to live for him. That's why it is not a big deal when God places, places in our heart in the, midst, in the midst of having all the commitments that we have. God says to us, empty the bank and give it away. Three times in our marriage we have done that. We emptied everything we have and give it away. I told this in the group of pastors. One pastor pulled me aside and asked, how? How would you do that? Where would, where, where would you pay your mortgage? How would this? At that time I was not even employed. We do. We do, as the Lord says. Why? Because it is God's responsibility. He's the one who says, I will give you a good life. He will. If he does, praise God. He doesn't, praise God. But he will. Because he's a good father. So we got to come. So don't be motivated by money. So what do I need to be motivated by? Can I give you five things, please? Write this down and then we'll finish. So until then, no worship team come up. <laughs> <laughs> Five things, five things. First thing is information. First thing is knowledge. You want to attract what God has for you, the opportunities and maximize it and grow in what God has and in the, in the process, increase the currency that flows into your life. Don't go after currency, follow information. Accumulate, accumulate. My wife yesterday made a statement because every time we are driving somewhere, I always give her some some nugget to think about, some paradigm to think about. She's like, Paul, ever since I know you, this is yesterday, you've been passionate about learning. I said, yeah, I learn. Oh, I'm passionate. I'm curious. The one thing that my mentors all say is, man, when I come to Sydney, I'm so tired. <laughs> you squeeze and squeeze in every penny, you know, you squeeze everything out of us and they still come. <laughs> Praise God. Because that's the posture we need to have. Get, become a resource pool of knowledge. The Bible says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. So in other words, become a person who understands things. Knowledge, accumulate it. But not just for the sake of knowledge. I have seen so many. If I, <laughs> one time it was, it was one of the comedians who said, Trevor Noah. This comedian was comparing the, the, the U.S. Uh, financial market and the U.S. the way they th talk about the sports. You ask anybody, what's the score last week? They will be able to rattle to you and they will be able to say how much this guy scored and what is his average and what is his batting average. And they will tell everything about their sports. Then you ask them about the financial market. Ah, oh, no, no, we don't know what's going on. Everybody says it's going to go up, it's going to go down. They don't have no idea. Sports, they are so passionate about, so, so knowledgeable. But this, no, th that's why I'm saying it's not just knowledge for the sake of accumulating knowledge. Knowledge for the sake of solving problems. Knowledge for the sake of saying, God, give me grace to understand things. To, to be a resource for, for others so, so I can bless information. Information that is relevant. And one thing about information is, uh, over the years I've realized, the more information you gather, God will give you grace to actually solve things. And that becomes a responsibility. When you see problems, you can't run away anymore because... You have seen it. You have seen the solution. So you can't run away. You can't unsee what you have seen. <laughs> so
So you got to do something about it. So responsibility comes in. And not only responsibility, when you solve it, actually you become authority. It flows into a place where you now know that, that problem is no longer a problem. Why? Because I've solved it already. I've solved it a couple of times. So the reality is information is key. That's why you, you, why would God train Egypt in Egypt, Moses? Why would God train uh, Joseph in Egypt? Because he gathered all the information. He knows all the intel that he needs when the time comes. So how do I get the intel right now in my age group? Read books. One of the things I ask pastors is what are the three management books that you've read in the last 90 days? I ask church leaders, what is the leadership books that you've read in the last 90 days? What is, if you're an entrepreneur, don't just, don't, don't just start a business. There are many people think, I, I, I just don't like the environment I'm working. I'm making somebody else rich. I'll go start my own business. You start. You're not actually, you've just taken one job to another job. You haven't started a business. Business means it has to run without you in the picture. That's when you are a business. If something that you do is able to produce without you being in the picture, that's a business. Then you are a business owner. But if you have to slave your life away, you just traded one job to another job. That's an information. So that's a paradigm. We got to think. And how do you educate yourself? Read books. There's a library. You know, I love the Khan Academy. You know, the, the Khan Academy in the YouTube channel, the Khan Academy, their motto is, mo they, they, got, they got math and science from young kids all the way to PhD that you can watch videos and learn. And their motto is this, this, this motto is beautiful. I love that. You know, it, it says, you only need to know one thing, that you can learn anything. You only need to know one thing, you can learn anything. In other words, train your mind to read, train your mind to reproduce what you read. So one of the things I tell my young people is, don't just read for the sake of reading. Read to replenish yourself. Read to be able to reproduce what you read. That's why integration is so important. What I've read and what I know, now I'm integrating it into my thinking. It expands your thinking. So information is key. The moment you have the right information, resources will flow into your hands. You don't have to go after it. The second one. The second one is a vision. The Bible says, have vision. Have a vision. Because without vision, what do people do? People perish or they lack restraint. Have a vision. What is the vision? My vision is not just to, to, be, to be just do this and do that and just have this and have that. No, no. Let it be like what Paul says. I've been caught up with a heavenly vision. I have a vision that is beyond this world. I see what he sees so I can do what he says. That's the vision that should guard your heart. Do you know that Egypt was a place where Joseph could have fallen into so many temptations? But what kept him in the path of righteousness? What not was, no, was nothing else but the vision. The vision to say, God will lift me one day. He gave me a dream when I was a teenager. He brought me to this country for that purpose. And he will lift me up one day. And there is no one greater in this house than I. He confessed that. One day I was reading this in the presence of God and suddenly the Holy Spirit just filled my heart with this revelation. Read that statement again. I read that statement that Joseph made to Potiphar's wife. Why I can't commit adultery with you? Why I can't sleep around with you? You know why? Not because, it will re it, not because it's a sin alone. It is a sin that will grieve God's heart. But there was something bigger that guarded his heart. You know what that was? That was a vision. He says, there is none greater in this house than I. No one. In other words, the position that he was carrying is, I'm not the head servant, I'm not the head slave, I'm actually the person who is going to be one day the ruler over Egypt. In other words, I have a vision that guards my heart. I have something more in my life. Leadership guru Sam Chand recently in one of the, one, he says in one of the conferences, he said, you know, do you know that statistically it says, Men from the age of 45 to 57, they are the ones who fall into adultery. 45 to, 45 to 57. So if you're in that age group, we pray for you. Hallelujah. <laughs> Keep yourself more accountable. The re reality is this. Temptation comes in any age. Hello. Right? But the reality is, on statistics, they say that's the vulnerable state. You know why that is a vulnerable state? You've achieved a certain peak in your life. There's nothing that is exciting you anymore. I told you guys already, don't come till I finish. Huh? 
don't, you've reached a peak somewhere, and now it's all slippery slope. I remember having this conversation, I remember having this conversation with uh, a doctor, an anesthetist. He was 35, 38 at that time. And he tells me, Pastor, I've achieved all my dreams. My bucket list is finished. I've got the income I want. I've got the house I want. I've got the car I want. I've got the resources I want. See, that's where it is. It's too small. Your dream is too small. Your dream is too small. And then you walk around with a badge. It's the favor of the Lord. I'm blessed. I'm prosperous. Who cares? Use the rest of your life for the glory of God and for the good. Otherwise, you will end up making trouble everywhere. Listen to me carefully. Be caught up with a heavenly vision the moment you don't have that vision that captures your heart. Your heart will go after all the little things of this world, the temporal pursuits, the fatal attractions. Come and give yourself completely to the Lord. That's the second one. The third one is a good name. A good name. You and I, we need good name. The Bible says good name is precious than gold or silver and precious things. A good name. Why is the good name so important, Pastor? You know why the good name is so important? That's when people will, they will follow, they will do, they will have, they will refer you to others. If you're a business, you're an individual, guard your name. But sometimes you have to die to your name, so you come and lay it down before God and say, God, give me grace not to be foolish. This week I was reminded again, Pastor Edmund sent me a WhatsApp and in that WhatsApp, he talked about what Billy Graham prays almost every day of his life. And Billy Graham said, Lord, it has taken me my whole lifetime to build. Don't make me destroy it today with my foolish decisions. In other words, don't destroy something that has taken years to build. It takes years to build a godly marriage. It takes years to build a godly trust with people. It takes years. Don't destroy it. That means live with that godly fear. Good name. The first billionaire athlete. Who was it? The first guy to reach the billion dollars in the athlete, as an athlete, is Tiger Woods. He was the first billionaire as an athlete. You know, he only played golf and won Golf championships, his, all his millions that he earned from golf championships is only about 168 or something like that. Less than 200,000, 200 million. But the rest came from endorsements. So the moment his character, his true character, his sexuality came out and the sens- how he is driven by sen- sexual passions came out, the, the endorsements stopped. Why? Because... One is built on your skill. You earn 200,000 based on your skill. The rest of the 800 million was based on your image. It was based on character. So the moment you lose the character, the image is spoiled, the money goes. Money goes. Money goes. That's why I say currency. It's a current. It will flow in. It will flow out. So rather than seeking after currency, seek after a good name that the Lord will give you grace. I told the staff this week that one of the things that the, the Bible says that the one woman who came to, in 2 Kings chapter 4, a woman came to the prophet and said, my husband died and I'm left with a huge debt. What do I do? And the prophet says, go and borrow vessels from all your neighbors and take the oil that is in your jar and pour it, pour it, pour it. It will multiply, it will multiply, it will multiply. And then go sell. My question is, if you come from a country like mine, where whole an old neighborhood knows what flight you're going in, who will give you the vessels? They will say, thank you very much. Ask your neighbor. Why? Because I had to keep my vessel with me. Because you're already so poor. Your creditors are coming after you. That means that woman must have had an incredible testimony among the neighborhood. For the neighbors to be able to open and say, take the vessels. How many do you need? Take everything we have. (laughs) It's because of a good testimony. People, you and I, we need good testimony in the workplace, in the marketplace, with the people that we do business with. We do need a good testimony. That's why money is not the main game. The main game is, Lord, be glorified. Last one. With that, we finish. Last one. Is that the last one? I'm only giving you three so far. Man, I got to hurry up. Fourth one. 
relationships, relationships, relationships. This is a very important point. I want you to highlight this, relationships. It was Joseph in prison when he met Baker and Butler. Pharaoh's Baker and Butler were instruments to bring him into Pharaoh's court. It was a relationship that he developed in that prison that one day God used to remind, remind Pharaoh there is a prisoner who has the wisdom of God. It is the relationships, people. It is the relationships that will bring you into the forefront, that will launch you into your career, that will launch you into your business, that will launch you into the things that God has for you. Relationships. That's why value what God brings into your life. The Bible says honor. You know, I've noticed in my life that if the, at any time there is a failure in any area of my life, it is usually because I've dishonored something that God wants me to honor. So you and I, we need to learn to honor what God has given. That means relationships are vital. You've got to honor the relationships. It was because of my relationship with Pastor Benny that God shifted the focus of my life and ministry. It's because of the relationship with Pastor Edmund that God shifted the focus of my life and ministry. Relationships. We, we are not self-made. God uses people to bring us. You know, Paul was sent back to Tarsus. He went to Tarsus. He lived in Tarsus for 10 years. Nobody wanted to do anything with him. Here is a godly man who gave his life to God. He's a Pharisee of the Pharisee. And yet, nobody wanted to do anything with him. But there was one man in Jerusalem that said, I'm going after this Paul. He went to Tarsus, asked him to come. Acts chapter 13, the Bible says, when he brought him back and he, they came to Antioch, there God spoke. Thank God for Barnabas. Because without Barnabas, you wouldn't have 13 of the Pauline epistles. Isn't God so good? He gives you people for that purpose. Ruth was blessed because of Naomi. If she had violated the relationship with Naomi, she would not have come back to Bethlehem. She would not have married Boaz. And Boaz will always remain ruthless. You and I, we got to understand relationships. Jacob would not have blessed and prospered until he had a godly relationship with Laban. He followed Laban. And he did what Laban asked him to do. Laban changed his salary three times. Cheated, in fact, his son-in-law. But yet, Jacob realized, if I'm going to prosper, it is because I'm attached to this guy. Relationships. That's why don't be nonchalant about relationships. Guard the relationships that God gives you. But have a discernment about relationships. Because when the devil wants to trouble you, he will send you relationships. When God wants to bless you, he will also send you relationships. You've got to keep your eyes open. Hear what God has. Last one. Finally. The Bible says, about all things, you get this one. You know, what is this one thing that you need to get? It is called wisdom. And wisdom from above. James chapter 1 verse 5 says, If anyone lack wisdom, let him ask of the one who is able to give him liberally. You and I, we need to come before God and say, God, I cannot rely on my academic qualification. I can't rely on my background and my networking ability or my skills to persuade people or the skills for marketing and sales or my skills to do what I'm called to do. No, 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 no. I don't depend on these things. I come before you. I need your wisdom. Give me a download from heaven. Every single day, ask for wisdom because that wisdom will, 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 will give you grace to make leaps and bounds in the areas of your life. Guard your heart. Ask God for wisdom and know this. James chapter 3 and chapter 4 says, there is a wisdom that comes from the pit of hell. There is a wisdom that comes from the system of this world. And there is a wisdom that comes from heaven. You got to learn to follow the wisdom that comes from heaven. When you learn to follow the wisdom that comes from heaven, you will be blessed because God is behind it. So go after it. So these are the things that's in my heart for you this morning. So as a church, if you're a parent, can I humbly ask this? favor. Send your kids to the youth ministry. Don't take them away from the youth ministry because we are not just giving them education. I follow a personal philosophy for my own children and this is what we do in the church. There are four things in which we train all our young people and all our leaders. Four things. We train them in the foundations. That's the theological thinking. We train them in formations. That's the spiritual disciplines, cultivating spiritual disciplines. We train them in the functions. 
we call them to do some leadership roles. Why? We want to develop them skills and give them abilities and capacity to do more. So we stretch them, functions. And fourthly, we give them frameworks. In other words, we give them models to think about. We give them models to think about, worldview to think about, value system to think about. Why this is important? Because anything that is worthwhile, that's going to stand the distance and, and, and be something that produces what God wants to produce in this world requires a proper building structure. It requires structure. So we got to develop those proper structures and structures come under these things. There's a conceptual structure. There's a cognitive structure. You and I, we need to build godly structures in life. And from that age group, they got to be growing. So what I'm saying is I'm saying for my young sons, Follow God wholeheartedly. Follow God wholeheartedly. And maximize your potential. Get a vision from heaven, a heavenly calling, a heavenly vision from heaven. Maximize your potential. And start serving God in simple ways from now. Don't go after money. Let money come after you. Go after the things that God has placed upon His heart in your life. Go after those things. Go after God. Go after the things that God has. God will prosper you. He will give you the good life He promises. So in closing, one last verse. Deuteronomy 8 and verse 10 and verse 18. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 10 and verse 18. The Bible says in verse 10, When God has given you all these things, you shall eat and be full, and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land He has given you. Hallelujah. God says, bless the Lord. That means praise will be on your lips when these things happen. God, it's you. And verse 18 says, and you shall remember it is the Lord your God who gives you the power to produce, to accumulate wealth. It is God who gives you the grace to do that. For what purpose? Next week, we'll look at it. That he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers. Would you rise up with me in prayer? Come, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, mighty God.